Uh, good evening, all. Uh, welcome to the third session of the integrated teaching by Amada School of Medicine. Uh, so we have uh, today Dr. Purnima, assistant professor from the Department of Microbiology. Uh, she will be dealing the session on laboratory diagnosis of urinary tract infection. As you know, UTI is one of the most commonly encountered uh, medical issue that we will say in day in and day out. And many of you would have experienced urinary tract infection also. So many times it's a very uh, big dilemma how to diagnose a patient with urinary tract infection. Majority of the time, when a patient come to the emergency room for us, they would have already received the antibiotics. When you look into the urine routine, there will not be any uh, pustules or maybe we will not be able to see anything. So still the patient will diagnose an UTI and then we uh, treat them like UTI and finally they recover. So it's a big dilemma and the bystander, we need to answer, it is a UTI. They will ask for the report at the time, there will not be any pustule, then why you are saying UTI? So it's a big thing uh, for a clinician perspective. So uh, over to Dr. Purnima, uh, please enlighten us about the laboratory diagnosis of UTI. And uh, for the next 40, 45 minutes, it's for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, introduction. So basically, you've uh, laid out things there on what uh, UTI is and what the dilemma is as far as the clinician is concerned. So uh, today, I'll be um, talking about the laboratory diagnosis part, Okay, how we uh, process the cultures that we receive in the lab and how we uh, interpret those cultures. Okay, and finally, how the report is sent to, uh, sent to the clinicians. So uh, let's begin without further ado. Okay, so as you all know, uh, the anatomy of the urinary tract is uh, broadly divided into upper and lower urinary tract. So the upper uh, tract consists of the kidneys and the ureters, and the lower urinary tract includes the bladder and the urethra. So uh, we know that our body is colonized by a lot of organisms, okay, and this is called as the commensal or the normal flora. Similarly, in the urinary tract also, we have the normal flora. So all the areas above the level of the urethra is ideally considered as sterile. Whereas once the urine, when it comes into the, uh, you know, part uh, at, uh, to the level of the urethra and below, it becomes contaminated with the commensal flora. So always when we interpret the culture results, we should uh, know whether the culture is significant or not. So in our uh, culture reports, you would have, Notice this particular term called as significant uh, colony count. So I'll get to that. And this is a reason why we uh, uh, give importance to this significant count because there is normal flora or commensal flora in the uh, area uh, in the lower urinary tract. Okay. So uh, this is uh, not the complete list, but these are the most common organisms that comprise the uh, normal flora of the urethra. So if any of these organisms are grown and isolated, we generally give a report of normal urethral flora grown. Okay, that's not uh, considered a pathogen. Okay, so uh, uh, isolates like coagulase negative staphylococci, excluding staphylococcus saprophyticus, which is considered a pathogen in women, especially of the reproductive age group. Okay, and then you have the viridin streptococci, lactobacilli, diphtheroids, and uh, non-pathogenic Neisseria species. So your uh, pathogenic Neisseria will be the Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a pathogen. But you have other non-pathogenic Neisseria also, which will be considered as a normal flora. Then uh, anaerobic cocci, propionibacterium, which is again an anaerobic organism, anaerobic gram-negative bacilli, commensal mycobacterium, and commensal mycoplasma species. These are the um, common uh, commensals of the urinary tract, which uh, commensals meaning they are not considered as pathogens. Now, what is the epidemiology of UTI? It is one of the most common bacterial infections and even in a nosocomial setting, it is a most common nosocomial infection. That is the cotti, which is catheter associated urinary tract infection. So um, this is also seen as an important complication in diabetes, when there is a renal damage or in transplant setting, structural or neurologic abnormalities interfering with urine flow. In any of these conditions, UTI can result. Okay, and it is also an important cause of gram-negative sepsis, your uh, urosepsis in hospitalized patients. So uh, coming to who gets affected, uh, in the first year of life, the incidence is pretty low in males as well as females. And uh, this uh, incidence, it remains low in males up to 60 years, but after that, the incidence increases. Whereas when you consider females, it is more common. Why? Because 
females have a shorter urethra and there is a close proximity to the perirectal region okay and because of this there is easy contamination and the uh, bacteria can ascend into the urinary bladder more easily in females so uti in females it increases with age and it goes to up to 20% in older women okay there is always a chance of reinfection in women and sexual intercourse increases the chance of acquiring uti in women and apart from that pregnancy also favors uh, you know an increase in infection so now how do we classify uti the first part we already saw the upper uti and the lower uti so i told you uh, the bladder urethra will comprise the lower uti so that anatomical classification we already saw now then you have ascending uti and descending uti ascending meaning from the rectal and uh, perianal flora the organism is ascending upwards and descending is from a uh, case of uh, pyelonephritis coming down okay and then uh, you have community acquired and hospital acquired and uncomplicated and complicated uh, meaning when there are other uh, anomalies it becomes a complicated uti renal anomalies becomes a complicated uti now coming to the actual pathogens that cause uti we saw the list of uh, commensal flora now let's take a look at the pathogens very commonly we uh, come across enterobacterials okay organisms like e coli escherichia coli protea species klebsiella so uh, e coli it's called as upec which is uropathogenic e coli okay, so these are the very common ones that we isolate and then you have a few gram positive organisms like staphylococcus aureus staphylococcus staphylococcus enterococcus species so all this can uh, be a common cause of community acquired uti similarly hospital acquired uti is also caused by these organisms apart from that you have other organisms like pseudomonas aeruginosa candida species etc so all these organisms we would have seen in culture reports that are issued from the laboratory rarer agents are acinetobacter species alkyl gene species gardner alava genealysis which causes a condition called as bacteriosis i'm sorry bacterial vaginosis and then chlamydia trachomatis these are difficult to isolate so these are not very common pathogens then there is a particular condition called as sterile pyuria okay so sterile pyuria is the condition wherein uh, when you look under the microscope you would find plenty of pustules in the urine sample but it won't grow anything the next day okay and this is a very classical condition of renal tb or genito urinary tb okay and in a very rare situations uh, we do see some parasites like trichomonas vaginalis or schistosoma hematobium um, uh, structures in the urine sample and some viruses like adenovirus can also cause uti so uh, this is a spectrum of uh, clinical manifestations in uti it can be a simple urethritis uh, asymptomatic bacteria i'll talk to you all about that then it could be a cystitis or a prostatitis it could be a urethral syndrome and it can go right up to a pyelonephritis kind of picture also now how does it develop what is the pathogenesis we already spoke about the ascending and descending uti so that's the main mechanism of um pathogenesis so ascending route is organisms from the git colonize the periurethral or vaginal area it enters the urethra reaches the bladder and it multiplies so that's how the infection sets in this is the commonest mode of infection in females why we already saw the reason because of the shorter length of the urethra and close proximity to the uh, rectoanal area okay and the next one is a descending route or the hematogenous or the blood borne dissemination yes, so yes, yes. Hmm. Like first day, day was, was uh, first day was uh, not the community medicine was not of, but, but yesterday was uh, nice. They, he, he was a family. Doctor, yes, sir. Hello, please mute. Abhin. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so this is the uh, descending route or the hematogenous route. This occurs as a result of bacteremia. and uh, finally the kidneys it will seed and the infection descends so here the most common pathogens are candida albicans mycobacterium tuberculosis as i said renal tb very rarely salmonella leptospira etc etc okay so pyelonephritis is the most common uh, manifestation of descending uh, uti now when a urinary tract infection sets in what does the body do what are the defense mechanisms that we have in the body 
to fight against urinary tract infections. Okay, the most important thing was the pH osmolality and the organic content of urine. Okay, and uh, we all know that the more you drink water, there is a better flushing action and it can flush out the microbes. So that's another way. Then the mucosa has a certain amount of antibacterial activity. Then there are uh, enzymes like the fencins, uh, lysozymes, etc., which are secreted. And uh, the uh, valvular mechanism, which prevents the reflux, okay, from the bladder to the ureter. So all these are the uh, protective factors in the event of a UTI. What are the risk factors? What are the risk factors? And uh, so here, mechanical obstructions like calculi or strictures will increase the chance of UTI. And as we already discussed, in women, pregnancy and hormonal changes can um, predispose the uh, lady to UTI. Then underlying conditions like diabetes, sickle cell anemia, then uh, indwelling catheters, polycatheter, or multiple instrumentation of catheterization can also predispose the individual to UTI. Now, broadly, how do you uh, know whether it is a lower UTI or upper UTI? Okay, uh, but the symptoms you can say to an extent. So uh, most commonly, uh, if it is a lower UTI, the patient will present with some amount of dysuria, urgency, frequency, and pyuria and pain and tenderness on palpating the suprapubic area. Okay. And what are the symptoms of upper UTI? They'll have fever and joint pain or renal angle tenderness along with lower UTI symptoms. This is a condition called as asymptomatic bacteriuria. So from the word itself, you will understand that the patient will not have any symptoms, but there'll be bacteriuria. There'll be growth when you culture the urine. Is it significant? Not in all cases, except in pregnancy and in patients who are going to undergo urologic procedures. In them, asymptomatic bacteria is considered significant. So this is basically isolation of a significant number of bacteria in culture. Uh, when the sample has been collected appropriately, if the collection is not uh, proper, there is no point uh, reporting it and uh, you know treating based on your report. But if the sample has been collected properly, and if there is a significant number of bacteria being isolated, and if the patient is a pregnant lady or someone who is going to undergo some urologic procedure, in them, this is considered significant. So this is asymptomatic bacteria. Now, let's look at the actual talk of the day, the laboratory diagnosis. So the first thing before uh, I get to the actual part of diagnosis is, uh, something on sample collection. So unless you send a proper sample, there is no point expecting a good result. If your sample collection is not proper and uh, the patient has not collected the sample properly, be it a mixed in urine sample or a catheterized uh, specimen, it has to be collected in the right way uh, for uh, you know the lab to give out a proper report. The report, uh, I mean, you can't uh, give any significance to the report unless the sample collection is proper. So uh, these are the four ways in which uh, different samples can be collected. So it could be a clean catch midstream urine sample or a catheterized uh, urine sample or a suprapubic aspirate in the case of children and early morning urine sample. Let's uh, look at each of these. So uh, the most commonly employed sample collection method is a clean catch MSU, which is a midstream urine sample. So uh, any case of UTI of, uh, um, say, some dysuria, the first thing that you would send for is a urine culture, which is a MSU. And uh, why? Because this is the least invasive. But the problem is there is always a chance of contamination of the samples unless the patient has been instructed how to collect these samples properly. Okay. So the first thing that you should instruct is the periurethral area has to be cleaned with soap and water. And in the case of women, the labial folds has to be retracted before the voiding process begins, okay? It is always the midstream urine. Why are we stressing on this midstream? Because the first part or the first voided uh, urine will contain the commensals. We said the urethra is, uh, you know, colonized with commensals. So we do not want these commensals to uh, come into the sample collection. So that part of the urine has to be voided and it is the second part which is collected. Nearly 20 to 30 ml should be there uh, in a wide mouth sterile container. It is a wide mouth container and the remaining portion can be discarded and it has to reach the lab within two hours. Why do we insist on this two hours? Because urine, it is a very rich medium and beyond two hours, it's going to grow a lot of other things and it will, uh, you know, your, uh, we should manipulate your result. Okay. 
so uh, the next one is a catheterized urine sample again another common sample collection uh, especially in hospitalized patients okay uh, icus or wards on chronic catheterization you need uh, samples that are drawn from the catheter polys catheter uh something you should understand is that this sample collection is considered invasive and it has to be uh, done under sterile precautions you should uh, you should take all aseptic precautions before collecting the urine sample from a catheter it should only be performed by a clinician or physician or a trained professional and why because this also has a chance of introducing urethral flora into the blood and you do not want that and never forget you should never collect the urine sample from the uro bag never should you collect it from the uro bag it should only be aspirated under sterile precautions from the catheter tubing so aseptic techniques must be followed and wear sterile gloves clamp off the tube and uh, it has to be uh, wiped with 70% ethanol the tubing okay the polys catheter and urine is aspirated with a sterile needle and syringe if there is a port to collect the sample the port can be used if there is no port you have to puncture the tube with a sterile needle and uh, aspirate the urine okay it should never be taken from the uro bag this uro bag is going to be contaminated and colonized with um, n number of pathogens and it will not give you a proper report next one is suprapubic aspiration especially in children and infants so uh, quite difficult to perform so uh, the skin over the bladder or the suprapubic area is disinfected and uh, the sample is uh, uh, taken using a needle and syringe the fourth type of urine sample that can be obtained is the early morning urine so uh, this is only indicated in a case of genito urinary tb or renal tb we need uh, the sample collection has to be done on 3 days and it is a per sample that is voided in the morning that is sent to the lab so uh, the urine is a, a very good supportive medium so that is why it is insisted that the sample should reach the lab within 2 hours of collection if if any delay is expected okay you feel that there might be a delay it has been collected in the night and uh, you no know, it sits in the ward nobody is there to send it to the lab please refrigerate the sample please refrigerate the sample and uh, then send it or if uh, it can be sent please send it within Two hours of collection. Now, what are the tests that we do in the lab once a sample is received? Okay, so there are uh, some tests uh, like the screening test. Uh, just for completion sake, I've put it here. There's a grease nitrate test, catalase test, microscopy or gram smear. We do the gram smear and uh, dip slide culture, glucose test paper, etc. But uh, the first thing that you would do when a urine sample comes to the lab is the urine microscopy. Okay, and uh, Uh, what we do is the sample will be well mixed and a drop of it will be taken on a uh, slide and you will put a cover slip and look under the microscope so you'll be able to see pustules rbcs any other uh, uh, if there is a pathogen or a commensal you can see the organisms moving around then cas or crystals and as we spoke about schistosoma and trichomonas you'll be able to see some parasites also so this is how uh, the urine will look under the microscope you can see uh, there are pustules okay and there are rbcs also in this particular image okay so this is how it will be seen after uh, the urine microscopy or wet mount as we say is done then uh, the uh, sample will be taken up for culture okay so this is the ultimate report that is expected right so uh, how do we do this culture uh we already spoke about how the lower urethral tract is colonized by commensal flora so that is why we always uh, talk about the significant count okay so you always uh, you know that there is going to be some growth in the urine because you have commensals there how do you know whether it is a pathogen of uh, 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 you know a, a level wherein the infection can set in okay how do you know that so there for that you have two types of culture it's called as quantitative culture and a semi quantitative culture quantitative culture we don't do it routinely it is quite complicated you have to uh, pour the urine and uh, it's it's uh, pretty difficult this is what uh, labs employ this is the semi quantitative culture okay so here again uh, into the urine the collection container uh, there is something called as the calibrated loop okay which each time it will deliver a fixed amount of urine okay 
let's say 0.01 ml or 0.001 ml and yeah so this is what is shown here this is the loop okay and you will draw a primary line on a blood agar plate and uh, make perpendicular line so that will be the secondary line and you will count the colonies after incubation so this is a semi quantitative method so uh, the cultures will be put upon sheep blood agar and mekong agar or gled which is uh, cled uh, another medium and it is incubated the plates are incubated at 35 or 37 degrees celsius for 24 hours or overnight so the uh, the concept is something called as cassis concept of significant bacteriuria so uh, if you uh, if you have seen the culture reports urine culture reports we'll mention something like this more than or equal to 10 raised to 5 cfu which is colony forming units per ml so only if it is more than 10 raised to 5 cfu per ml can this uh, isolate be considered significant so you would have seen reports wherein uh, it says e coli more than or equal to 10 power 5 cfu per ml which is significant okay so in this case the uh, growth can be considered significant but there are certain situations wherein less than 10 power 5 cfu per ml is also considered significant and this is the list so uh, in a yeah in a suprapubic specimen in a catheterized specimen nephrostomy specimen on a, in a patient who is already on antibiotic therapy so why this is important is they would have ideally uh, the sample should be taken before initiating antibiotic therapy but if the patient is already on antibiotic therapy the antibiotic would have worked to an extent so that will decrease the colony count in that case also this uh, lower values are considered significant and then uh, in the case of gram positive infections complicated uti as i said in case of renal anomalies etc and also in pilo nephritis in all these conditions any value less than or equal to 10 power 5 is also considered significant but ideally the significant value is more than or equal to 10 power 5 cfu per ml and another thing that we commonly see is uh, there will be a growth of more than three organisms okay if it's if it's a, but let's say e coli alone or e coli and uh, klebsiella it's two organisms we do report it but if there are more than three organisms first thing is it will be difficult to isolate them okay and in such scenarios we'll uh, not proceed the sample any further we'll give the comment that it is a contaminated specimen and this contamination has happened because of improper sample collection in which case when you get such a report please instruct the patient to uh, draw the sample the right way uh, the midstream urine sample and resend the sample that is the only thing that can be done growing more than three types of organisms it is uh, you know highly likely that uh, the sample has been contaminated by collection so this is the commensal that is growing there there is no point identifying and reporting it now uh, coming to the last part uh, how do you treat so just again for completion if it is community acquired empirical fluoroquinolones can be initiated or cotrimoxazole or nitrofurantoin and in the case of uh, complicated uti uh, we need some third generation cephalosporins and which has to be escalated or deescalated based on the sensitivity pattern and uh, if it is a hospital acquired uti or a ca uti carbapenems or tetras has to be initiated so yeah that's it. that was my last slide thank you there are any questions Okay, students, if there are any questions, please unmute and ask. Or you can share it in the chat box also if you have. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Pana, for that uh, uh, very, very informative session. Uh, Thanks, sir. Yeah, thank you. And uh, students, see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good night.